Well, good morning to you. Good morning. As good as a semi-final performance, as good as a performance as we've ever seen from Leinster, it's like right up there. Yeah, we're definitely right up there. Um, yeah, the, well, pretty complete, obviously, save for the um, five-pointer that they conceded in the 78th or 79th minute, um, but you'll forgive them for that. Um, just defensively and an attack, very, very good. The continuity of play between forwards and backs, the control at half-back. Um, yeah, the aggressive line speed, the, the centred pairings working together, having not played together for a while, just the whole performance I thought was was outstanding and they never really let Scarlets into the game. Um, you know, w when you starve a team of that much possession and territory, uh, Scarlets didn't really do a whole lot wrong. They just never ever got a go, go at them. It felt like there was um, an intensity to the performance from Leinster right from the get-go that like, they, they weren't talking about revenge in the build-up, but they were clearly annoyed with what happened last season in the two semi-finals. The semi-final of the mm. Champions Cup where they didn't, they didn't start that game really well, but they came back into it against Claremont. And that also they got hammered by the same team yeah. in the RDS. Uh, there was a kind of sense of mission about them, which when you add that to the quality that they have, it's very hard to beat. Yeah, I think just the the range to their game was was the most impressive thing. They um, they kept it in tight. They were very direct. They started you know, a, a huge amount of the front door options. You know, I think they got caught last year trying to go out the back door a little bit too early. And the problem with that is when players read through and smash it in. You know when you've got some of your team in front of of the ball, then it's hard to recycle it, and the momentum all switches with the opposition. So. They chose an awful lot of front door options, you know, late footwork at the line from the forwards. Um, the hard yard seemed to be a little bit easier to come by for them yeah. than they were for, um, for Scarlets. You look at you know, the footwork and, uh, and the agility of James Ryan and Fardy and how they were able to get to soft shoulders and just being able to build and regenerate um, made it just that little bit easier for the knock-on phases. It also feels like it's a really different team from last year, like just because of James Ryan and Fardy and Levy. Like, it's only three players, but Jesus, what three players? Yeah, they've been all outstanding. Um, you know, I'm part of the uh, European Player of the Year um, panel, and Fardy's been you know, nominated. Um, you know, we picked a 15 back in January, I think it was. And you can't break from that 15, but you look at the likes of Levy, you know, surely he should be yeah. able to find his way back in there. Should be um, a medical joker. Yeah, um, and James Ryan has been outstanding. Um, I think you, for, you forget a lot of them, those performances have obviously come through Ireland as well. Maybe they didn't feature as heavily early on, but Levy's been outstanding uh, for the whole season, uh, particularly in Sean O'Brien's absence. Uh, but Fardy just brings that, that cleverness um, that Aussie cleverness that we that you know that we've had in the past and that we've missed when we haven't had it. Um, you had it with Elson, who was the big ball carrier, but yeah. I think it's almost a combination of of Elson and um, and Nathan Hines, the, the savviness of that, of understanding when to play the ball at nine when you when you've lost your nine. Um, that little one two to James Ryan, he's just so smart. Yeah, you know, no James. Uh, Jameson Gibson Park around, so I'll play half back, and he doesn't wait for everyone to set up and for everyone to be in position. If it's there at the base, he plays it. Yeah, and away you go. Because if if we're not fully ready, you can be sure the defence isn't ready. So it's an in instinctive kind of understanding of the ebb and flow of the game. I think it's just a, a he's a footballer. Yeah, and uh, and that's why he's able to play second row and six. And um, he's he's a he's a brilliant addition because he brings a big edge to us as well. Yeah, like uh, to Leinster. So I got to start saying <laughs> us, right? It's all right. Here. I, I know. I'm four years. I'm four years in. No, no, no. To Leinster. <laughs> I'm, I'm I'm a neutral. Uh, yeah, uh, look, well, this isn't BT. It's fine. We're gonna, we can totally, we can totally, be, we can totally be us here. We get it. Was it you before the game was saying that the missed tackle count was far less important from Leinster? That actually, because um, in the build-up to the game, Dave had been terrifying us all with these stats about how, uh, of all the teams that are left in the competition, Leinster have far more missed tackles than anybody else. And you know, Scarlet like to if you're going to miss a tackle in the wide channel, it's going to result in a try. But but they don't miss them that often in the wide channel. That's the thing. Leinster's spacing. I think this is what differentiates them from Ireland is is their defensive system, and they they just they play it slightly differently. I think their spacings are better. I think Ireland are more susceptible to getting caught in the wide channels because they get narrow. Why and how does it happen? I think it's a spacing thing. I, I don't think they their alignment. Well, there's two things. I think the Leinster wingers play way higher, um, and there's much more of an onus at fullback to cover the backfield, plus either the ten or the nine. 
So it's really only two in the backfield and then the Leinster wingers only play a couple of yards off their, their centre, whoever the second last man is. So they're playing much more aggressively. A lot of the time they're leaving last man over and that's why they're playing hard up rather than trying to play any way soft. So if, you, if the first pass is thrown and it's a long pass, sometimes there's a, a, an ability for a ring rose to be able to read and, and get onto that. And then the winger just follows them in. Whereas with Ireland, you know, the, the winger plays off a lot more, is kind of hedging his bets as to whether there might be a kick option. And that connectivity between 13 and wingers means you've got to automatically play a little bit softer as a 13. Because if you go quickly and you, and you, and you miss your man, he gets it away, then your winger is absolutely screwed. Because uh, you, know, you, you immediately create a two on Whereas if he's following you into that channel as well, the likelihood of getting two fast passes away is... is um, is less so. It's diminished. Um, Henshaw and Ringrose have combined in a defensive masterclass today. What was it that was so impressive about them? Just the, their ability to be able to read um, when it was on for them to hit through the line, um, when it, where to close it off. And sometimes defence isn't all about making tackles. It's about scaring the opposition into going back inside. And yeah. sometimes I saw at one stage, you know, there were massive numbers down and Ringrose defended on his own and then forced an error. Just he, he forced the hand of Scarlets. They mightn't have wanted to do exactly as it was what he encouraged, but he just stayed off, stayed off, stayed off. But then other parts of his games he's able to go, right, this is on for me. There's you know, there's no viable option for this particular forward who's about to get it, you know, inside or outside, so bang, in, makes a big collision, you know, the ball can spill or you get a, a, you know, momentum in front foot. Yeah, so they're, defensively they were great, but also as a, an attacking unit, um, there was a, a beautiful long skip pass from Henshaw very early on in the game. And we were like, His shoulder's fine, because mm. it was just a beautiful, fluid sort of, I think it's that Issa. Um, yeah, it was, yeah. The, wing. the one that, that, that little chip kick in and, and then yeah, cleaned up by Rob Carney as well. And you, you, you could see how pumped players are when... Um, you know, when you know, Carney made a collision and I think it was Steph Evans came across and those big hugs went around. They were really into that game. And I think they were, like, you, I think they were stung badly about that semi-final defeat last year to Scarlet, particularly having lost a man in, in the game as well. They were beaten by 14 men. There's somewhat of a humiliation to that, particularly close, when you're at home. Yeah, when you're at home and you've got absolutely smashed. So they did feel that they owed them one. And um, whatever you might say about the home advantage and being unfair being back in the Aviva, it, it, on a performance like that, it wouldn't have mattered where in the world that game was. Yeah. It was only going to be one winner. What about Henshaw's recovery? It, it seems remarkable that, we just saw the photograph of it there, that he can come back so quickly and to be at that level. Yeah, it is actually unbelievable. It really is. Like, so I've had a shoulder reconstruction. Now granted, it's um, you know, what is it, 13 or 14 years ago. Um, and um, from the surgical process, now it's all keyhole. Before I was, you know, you big slice and dice, yeah. and yeah, and so immediately the recovery time from that is is going to be extended. But um, they can do keyhole surgery now. But I think it's the level of aggressiveness within the rehab and how how much they want to push it. And yeah. I and I must say, huge credit to Leinster and the IRFU for they seem to be um, they seem to be quite cutting edge in in where they're going with their medical team. Um, they've had some really impressive um, recent... Um, who's it? Phil Glasgow and, and Winkleman have come in yeah. in performance roles uh, and they've been absolutely outstanding in, in aligning the provinces with the national team. And what happens is players go into the national setup and you know, there's a national program and a, and a provincial program, and they're not aligned. And so, someone do, goes and does an exercise in the national setup that they haven't done at provincial. Straight away, they're strained or they're you know, using muscles that they haven't used before. Then they go out the pitch. They've got an extra stress of new calls and an extra pre pressure of I'm in an environment that I don't know. So it just it, there, there was no cohesion. So they've pulled all that together, and uh, I think that aligned with you know. Obviously, Hannah Mullet, I know, was the, was the surgeon for, uh, for Robbie Henshaw, but he was able to uh, work with the medical staff and, and encourage an aggressive um, regime to be able to push him back. And they were, they were, the, the rehab went so well that they were kind of wondering, you know, was this an, an anomaly? Yeah. Like, yeah. So they went and got independent testing done um, away in Santry to make sure that all the scores ma you know, matched up. Um, PBs in the weights room, PBs in speed, 
Uh, I think Robbie got his best ever DEXA scan, which is body composition, uh, fat testing. He looked pretty sharp. He, he looked fast, strong, lean. He's always, his big asset has always been his engine. Um, and it never, that would never have concerned me because he comes back in the fourth, fifth game of the season every year, usually one of the big games in lead up to, to, um, to Europe, and it's often Munster, and he's an 80 minute guy. Yeah. And um, that's why they were so desperate to get him back in there. As great a job as Issa had done in the centre, Robbie Henshaw's you know, another level, and then you have the luxury of putting Issa back out onto the wing. And then we finally begin to see the partnership of the 12 and 13 develop as a tandem, um, both from an offensive and defensive point of view, and they look amazing. Yeah, they, they really are very, two very, very good players. And the more they play together, the more they train together, be it at Leinster or Ireland, they, um, they'll get more used to one another. So that, that element of telepathy will come into play where you know, there's no need for communication. They'll just w read body language off one another. Um, they'll, um, they'll dovetail, they'll you know, share the workload where you know, someone makes a tackle. And what happens you know, off, off, off first phase, when someone makes a tackle in the midfield, you've got to get a split out to the far side. So if the tackle's made outside of 10, he's usually the one to go. But if 10 makes it or 12 makes it, um, you know, there's an onus on making sure that you get some speed to the, to the extremity. And that's where you have to share that workload. That's where I watched during the Six Nations, um, uh, Gary Ringrose coming back in and Johnny Sexton was sending him the whole time from, from one side of the pitch over to the other. And that's his seniority, I suppose, and delegation of, of role, but, but also the Ringrose's willingness to get across yeah. there and, and work for the team. I think, you know, whatever about all the talent and, and the footwork and the physicality, but it's their willingness to work so hard for the team that I think separates these two. And, and I think probably speaks to the culture of the group as well. Like, um, we talk about culture and sport as being so important over such a long period of time, and it was one of the things that Johnny Sexton said, oh, the culture had changed. That time that he came back and gave them all um, that verbal rocket that didn't go down so well in the mm. changing room by all accounts. And here we are, but everybody is making that. Everybody has that level of application and they're, they could all be big time Charlies if they wanted to be. Yeah. Like, you know, somebody like uh, Ryan's never lost a game. It's like, he could be, but it seems like that won't be accepted and that that's not the thing that they're going to be built on. Well, not with people like Johnny Sexton um, in, in there. He's, um, you know, I, I think he's, he's everyone, at, or Johnny's brilliant at keeping tabs on everyone. I think he even saw the comments after. Um, after the game, talking about Larmer and the rollicking that he gave him when he called <laughs> called the ball to himself on the blind side when there were six uh, six scarless defenders over on that right hand side and there was a clear overlap and and he really he really lets him lets him let him know about. It. I have we actually have that clip. I have a listen. Here he is. What did you make of uh, Jordan Larmer? I saw you talking to him during the match. As the game was going on. He made quite an impression. Me? I think it was you. Yeah, you were chatting away to him. Yeah, Just a friendly yeah. chat. <laughs> friendly chat. He backs himself. Uh, he backs himself against ten scarlets on the short side. <laughs> and we had a six-man overlap on the other side. Uh, I said, "Did you call for the boys?" Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so he just didn't manage to beat one of them out of the ten. But uh, it's the beauty of those young lads. They, they back themselves. And look, he had a, you know, I thought he had a great game in the second half. And when you lose a player like Fergus, who, who brings so much to the team. Uh, to have him stepping in, uh, quality operator was, was brilliant. Yeah, no, it's a nice little gentle, don't do it again. Yeah, yeah, it is. It's a warning. It's a yeah. warning shot right yeah. there. Um, but, you know, when Larmer, when Larmer does get the ball, God, you know, no one knows what he's doing. He doesn't know, I don't think, himself, but that footwork is yeah. crazy. And that's why he is actually a little bit better at fullback because he gets more of an opportunity to showcase it. I think space. It didn't really open up for him at the weekend, but once or twice he created something from nothing. And um, in traffic, in traffic. How yeah. good is he going to be? Like the word is that he's going to be really, really special mm. uh, because he gets it. And mm. it's you know lots of these guys, lots of players come through maybe not with that level of talent, but with huge ability. But you have to have the mental capacity. You have to have the willingness to to learn and to and to work. Um, the appetite for it, and, and apparently he has it all. He, he picks things up immediately, and I think that's why they're so excited by him. Uh, obviously, McFadden gets injured in the act of scoring the try, which really seals the game. At that stage, you can't really see um, Scarlett getting back into it, and 
if that's going to be in any way a long-term injury, if it's going to put him out, you'd feel really sorry for him because he's just back from a couple of bad injuries and back in the team and totally deserving of his place in the team. Yeah, I think he's, well, I know he's his captain and, you know, is he number one winger? It's, it's a toss-up, you know. I think Ferg has played himself back into the team because he's defensively so strong, because people always wonder, you know, what, what does McFadden do? He's not particularly quick, he's not big, he's, you know, he's not that strong, he doesn't do anything brilliantly. But what he do, does do, and I think players have a full appreciation for it, is um, it's the element he brings at the rook. So out wide, you know, if, if, if a rook needs clearing, he's the man for the job. He is actually very strong for a small enough guy. Um, he does, yes, he made a mistake off the kickoff, you know, which he'll, he'll be uh, killing himself over because he can't do that off, off scoring three points and then immediately cough yeah. up a, a, a scrum. Um, so those sort of elements need to be cut out. But I thought, in general, his decision on the, uh, just before the James Ryan try, he realised he wasn't getting in, managed to cut back in field, just recycled the ball. It's simple things done well and he's very much a cog in the wheel. And I just think he brings a big security to, to the wing um, where maybe James Lowe, which is documented in the papers a few weeks ago, he doesn't quite get it yet defensively, he's yeah. getting there. Yeah. But McFadden 100% understands it, good in the air as well. Um, so just a, a, a very well-rounded player and, and fits into this Leinster team extremely well. It looks like Luke McGrath will probably be back. You would expect him to go back into the team. Gibson Park played well, but he not played well really well. I think he played really well. So I maybe think, he keeps his place? No, I don't think he does. I think Luke McGrath is still the number one choice, I think. Uh, but I, I, I must say, I thought he did have a bit of an armchair ride. It was, um, yeah, no. you know, it was, a, it was a gorgeous situation for any scrum half to come into when you're getting that quality of ball because of the efficiency at the ruck. I thought that was one of the real elements of Leinster's improvement. Um, from last year. Of, um, and, and even from early parts of the season, I think that's where Ireland are really good, is their identification of the rook and, and not losing too many numbers to it, not going to dead rooks, realigning when you realise this rook is done, where, how can I offer on the next phase? So I thought their pinpointing of, of how the rook needed clearing also, you wouldn't have known that John Barkley was playing the game or James Davis, and that's quite the compliment to to our back row because they, um, you know, they've been two of, of Europe's best pilferers. Does that happen in the video room, or like, how do you teach a team to be better collectively at that over a period of time? Um, yeah, it does happen in the in the video room. I think it happens at training. But you, you don't. You, it, it's all about simulation these days. You can't. You can't be. You know, smashing into one another Tuesday, Thursday of a, of a big yeah. semi-final week. So it all has to be simulation, all has to be body height. Um, and then that comes back to video work. So if people don't have the body heights, coach will say, listen, we're not doing contact on the back, on the back of, I, I think you're going to show, show me good body height in the game. Are you going to do that? Although if you're not going to do that in training, we'll go back to playing f full contact. I know that's what they do internationally and I'd imagine that's still what they're doing in, in Leinster because particularly at this stage of the season, you can't, uh, you can't be beating bodies up. So it's about having good body shape and making sure that um, the picture is good. F so then on Saturday afternoon, you're in that body position to be able to make that impact. To go back to the, um, uh, so, uh, obviously, if McFadden's out for a while, there's the possibility that James Lowe comes in, depending on how many, um, if McGrath's fit, then suddenly that's that's grand. You don't need Jameson Gibson Park to play. But it, it does kind of speak to, there is some depth in the Leinster back line at the moment. But if, say, you were to take one of their first choice out halves or back up full backs away, the way it's being mooted at the moment by the IRFU, mm. by shunting one of them off to um, Ulster, suddenly you don't have a whole heap of um, depth if somebody gets injured. That's the problem with your second and third string players. You don't want them to be that good. You want them to be good, but you don't want them to be really impressive because immediately others will come looking for them. Yeah. So it's a tricky one for them because they're going to leave, um, potentially they could, one of those, Carberry or Byrne, um, could leave a, a winning culture, a winning environment. You look at someone like Jordy Murphy, I have to say, he, he, you know, it can't be easy playing some of the best rugby of his life, both from a Leinster perspective, but also from Geordie's perspective, where things are clearly not going right in Ulster. They don't have a coach, the, you know, a little bit of a basket case at the moment, and he's going up there to try and play his, his rugby from next year on, where, you know, when the decision was made, whatever it was, six months ago, 
he was fourth in the pecking order. He didn't know that Josh van der Fleer was going to be injured, Sean O'Brien, and he didn't know he was going to get as much game time as he has done. Yeah. So likewise with, with a Carberry, or, or a, I think it's more likely to be a Ross Byrne who'll want to go and, and get more game time. Um, that is, you know, if Carberry is used a little bit more often at 10, you know, Joe Schmidt has to be pulling his hair out that Carberry's only had um, w one outing um, for, for Lencer starting in the number 10 jersey and he's his backup number 10. That's not ideal. So someone's going to move um, and probably quite soon just to get game time because you can't have three quality operators at 10. I would say no if I was the two lads. No, not going. Yeah, but it's a tough one, you know. It, it is because I, I would I would too because you're, there's a good chance you're going to be winning medals or you're going to be in the hunt for winning medals. At and the also, moment, the, the Ulster are a while away from that. Isn't the coaching better? Like, I have a coaching ticket here which has... That, that, that's the other thing. So a young player... How am I actually going to get better? Every, yeah, so they don't know... Not knowing what's going to happen up in Ulster, um, who's going to come in, you know, who's... Am I going to improve as a player? Whatever about playing more often, what skills, what, what am I being taught on a week-to-week yeah. -week basis? So, yeah, I wouldn't be in a rush at the moment. Certainly, that wouldn't be my first port of call. Um, but, um, yeah, the, you know, maybe they will be encouraged or maybe you know, the IRFU or Joe Schmidt will put an arm around the shoulder and have a quiet word saying, if you have aspirations to be involved in the longer term, maybe you need to go and look at playing more regular football. Yeah. Um, wouldn't there be another way of doing this by giving Johnny Sexton six months off? Yeah, but when? To try and take Johnny Sexton out of the game for six months. I know, but like, we do want to win a World Cup and we have a, we have a collection of players here and say you give them from the end of this season up to Christmas off. Yeah. That means all the November internationals will be uh, Carberry playing 10 and Ross Byrne will play all the games for Leinster. <clears throat> Suddenly he's got like 10 massive games and then Sexton comes back and he's his way back in and everybody's happy. That would be smart. <laughs> that would be smart. Um, it's going to happen. I, I don't see Johnny saying, yeah, I'll, you know, I'll take six months off. The only thing I would say is that he's, he's less annoyed these days when, when he's whipped after 60 or 70 minutes. Now, some have been forced through injury and some because games have been won and there's no need to keep him out there. So he, he's starting to get uh, appreciative of the fact that he does need a little bit of minding. So maybe he's not averse to, uh, to six months off, um, but you, you don't... You don't play rugby to train. You just don't. And that's not that, that's not his mentality. And um, I think he would struggle with not having something on a week-to-week -week basis. Like go go travel. Go and <laughs> you know. <laughs> no, that's not happening. Go and sit in the beach. Bring your bring your three kids with you. Yeah. yeah Come on off the family. ball, AM. <laughs> well, you know. Um, but like, there's definitely. Uh, I, I think the other thing that Leinster probably have is that um, Ross Burns' little brother is coming through and is also an out half and is apparently very good. So, but say for example. Um, it was burned to go. Carberry goes off and plays the November Internationals or as part of that squad. Who's Leinster's out half for the five games in the league that they play at that point? Are they are they hiring an outsider to come in and play? No, or? you can't do that. So like, it defeats like, the purpose of it. Doesn't it? Yeah. yeah. So, um, so I, I don't know. I d listen, there's no perfect formula. Because of, because of how we're centrally contracted, and it really works in our favour, um, when it comes to international, uh, it sometimes it feels as though on occasion it hurts the the, the provincial setup because we aren't allowed to pick and choose from um, from you know anywhere in the world. You have yeah. to go through um, you know through a process of as to whether um, a, a player can fit in on the basis of is there some is there an Irish equivalent in other provinces. Um, so it would be stupid to, to kind of send two tens off somewhere and uh, give Johnny a break and yeah. then you, you, you're left with nothing, particularly in a, an important position like 10. But I'm sure there's lots of conversations to be had over the course of the next um, six months, maybe a year, maybe next season isn't, this, isn't the season to be deciding it, but we won't really know. The landscape changes massively if Johnny Sexton takes any time off yeah. because then you've got your two tens staying put and there's no pressure on And them. everybody's happy. Yeah, everybody yeah. And I think they'll probably... Ross Byrne is, has really grown this year. He's gotten a lot more game time than he would have imagined, I would think. Leinster really love him. Yeah, they do. They like, do. They think that he's got to make massive strides really quickly. I think he's really improved this year. I, you know, he looked like a nice, solid player and I think he's come on. Um, he's reading the game very well. His game control looks good. Um, Joey obviously has lots of talent and he's just a little bit looser um, 
and he needs to just tighten it up. Whereas Ross needs to expand his game a little bit. Yeah. Um, to be, um, I wouldn't. I, I think it's unfair to say less robotic because he's not that. But I think to be, um, to have. Um, more elements to his game rather than just being seen as a kicking 10 or a, or a passing 10 to be able to then make himself the option. One last point about this, is it, is it definitely Ulster who are the main potential destination or is it possible Munster needs to look at their at half situation? Well I think uh, um, on the basis of, of yesterday I don't think Ian Keatley had his, his greatest game. Obviously Tyler Blaindall had gone and had another neck surgery as yeah. far as I know and two neck surgeries for any professional athlete. I'd be concerned about that as to whether he's going to come back into the game uh, or, or not. It, it, um, it's got to be a, a concern for him, but also for, um, for, for Munster. Um, Keatley um, has been solid this season, better than, than other years, but yet is that enough to go and, and, and win Europe? Yeah. Um, I'm not entirely sure. So maybe, you know, in Munster, when when Ian Madigan was leaving, um, Munster um, supporters were you know were shouting from the rooftops, you know, "We'll take him gladly." Why yeah, why yeah. is he leaving Leinster to go further afield? Um, so whether you know there's a spot for him to come back into one of the provincial teams, I know that he's on big money over in Bristol, and whether the RFU is willing to um, to pony up um, that sort of money or not will, will remain to be seen. But um, there are plenty of good tens to go around. I just, just don't know whether they all we're willing to it. hand <laughs> any of ours over. There's that we again. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. Right, so uh, Munster, here is Rory Scannell speaking with Dave McIntyre after uh, they took a bit of a paddle, in, particularly in that first half in Bordeaux. Overall, Rory, how frustrating is it, is it to play in a game like that where you, you almost feel like you're struggling for air, that everything you try and the harder you try it just doesn't seem to come up? Uh, yeah, the first half was quite frustrating. You know, we were 21-3 down and... I thought we played some quite good rugby in the second half, but when you give a team like Rassing a 20-point lead, you're, you're going to struggle to come back from that, and um, unfortunately we left our best rugby towards the end, which is uh, disappointing. So, um, yeah, we'll review it, and obviously our European journey's over for this year, but it's all to play for in the league, so we're looking forward to that. Do you feel that turning over at half-time, just before half-time, they celebrated like they'd got a score of their own at the other end, that that was one of the, the many turning points of the game? Uh, yeah, they rely on those kind of big moments, you know, their big boys turning over ball there and um, we were kind of camped in their line for a few minutes and uh, I think if we came away with a score just before the half we would have been in with a shout, um, but unfortunately it wasn't to be and they got a, a vital turnover on the stroke half time and, you know, that could have easily been the turning point in the game. And the second half, was there any belief still or was it a case of let's try and win the first, second half and play for some pride? Um, no, I think we said at half time we were pretty confident. Um, we could, we could still win the game. Yeah, it um, didn't really work out for them though. Um, that first half performance from Racing was sensational. Yeah, it was. It was. And I, I, it banged a little bit of, la of last year's semi final with Leinster. You know, when you let Cla a team like Claremont off to two, two quick scores, it's, 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 you're playing catch up. And, yeah. it's, and it's a bad place to be, even if you try and play your own game, because immediately there's a bit of panic sets in. You think, this wasn't meant to happen. We didn't plan for this throughout the week, and we've given them three scores. They haven't had to work incredibly hard for them, um, and you know we've made some bad defensive errors and, and lapses. And all of a sudden, you know, we're, we've only got three points on the board ourselves. They've got twenty-one, and then before you knew it, it was twenty-seven-three yeah. um, after half time. And they really needed to score that first try or the the first score in the, in the second half to just give them a bit of momentum. But they looked. Yeah, Munster did look flat. They looked, for the first time in ages, they looked devoid of ideas. I think once Racing worked out that the chap tackle was where they were going to go for the game and the ferocity that they went into it, I think Munster looked as though they, they lacked in a, pl in a plan B. Um, and it, it just shows the importance of their go forward from their back row and from Stander and how what a great job that Racing did to contain him. I think he had... 20 odd carries for like 31 or 32 meters yeah. and so if he has that has the ball in his hands usually for that you know that meant that, um, that amount of time you make an 80 um, meters, 90 he, meters, yeah, go he's, forward. He's, he's getting them and yeah and what he does when you hit high on him he still gets three meters but they you know the angle was phenomenal Wences Lare was absolutely brilliant Classens came on he was outstanding LaRue went through and you had a big 55 or 60 minutes I thought their back row was absolutely top class and that was the difference ultimately if if 
you're going to compete against a team like Racing who are performing at that level. All of the things you do have to be perfect. So when your right half has a penalty, he has to find touch. And when you do find touch and it is your line-out, you've got to find your own jumpers. Their line-out was absolutely abysmal. Yeah, their accuracy half. was poor. And um, it, it, the scoreline did flatter them in the end because you know, Racing were better than five-point victors. But you know, it was a very different second half, and particularly very different last 20 minutes by, you know, from Munster. They got into their rhythm a small bit. Um, they attacked them. They went after soft shoulders. Obviously, Zebo came on and played well. But um, ultimately, the handbrake had been pulled up by, by Racing at that stage. But that, that accuracy in the first half, when, you're, when you are choosing to kick to the corner, you've got to make your touches. And then when, you, when you, know, you force a penalty in the scrum and you kick to a line out and then you overthrow or you don't hit your jumper, um, it's, you know, the knock-on effect is it's, it dents your morale, you lose all the momentum, you lose possession, yeah. and then ultimately you lose territory as well. So um, they just couldn't. And then when they, when they did try and put a few passages of play together, very um, uncharacteristically, they, they were throwing passes into touch. They, you know, they, ha they felt as though their hand was forced of them. How did that happen to a team as, as experienced and as good and as consistent all season that we've seen from Munster? All of a sudden, it's like the basics that you expect them to be able to do. They can't do I, them. They just looked a bit shell shocked. That's what it was. I think when when no team this year have been as aggressive in their line speed and the chop tackle like like Racing were, and when they. They didn't have any way of getting over the advantage line. They, they needed to go to the corners a little bit more. They needed uh, to go to the air. Um, Rasting from very early on, it, it became apparent that they were going to leave the last man over, so the kick pass was going to be on. Yeah. Um, but I don't know if any of that was identified. I don't know if they had enough possession um, either to be able to you know, really put a string of phases together because Rasting themselves were pretty miserly with it. Um, is there any way they get in their own heads with Dunnick Ryan in the line out? Like the, even the first line out, they try a trick play as opposed to, as I was saying earlier, give it to Peter Manny at the front of the line out. Just get the first one off and away you go, let's see what happens. Mm. But instead it's like that short line out and a forward pass. Yeah, and then it was, it was like, well, didn't he actually even go over the, you know, the five? Um, that was yeah. Always, I was, yeah. And I, I read um, Holland during the, the week talking about how Dunnick Ryan knew their, their line out calls and yet you can't change it. You, can't, you don't want to confuse yourself just for the sake of one person. But, it, it really it, it hurt them, you know, their, their, um, their lack of accuracy at line-out. Um, Marshall came on and it was a little bit better, but uh, yeah, it was when, when, you're, when you are gaining penalties and you're kicking to touch and you're losing your first phase possession, how do you get any launch? How do you get into a game? Very, very hard. And you think about how few times we saw Scannell and, and Arnold carrying the ball into midfield to then be able to get stand around the corner. The simple things that Munster have done so effectively. Yeah. Ball carry, pot around the corner and get over the advantage line. We saw hardly any of that. That's because of, of poor quality line -out ball. Their scrum was a little bit better. They got a penalty or two from it, but you know, they also got... Um, I thought JP Doyle was particularly on the, um, on the five metre scrums. He, he probably could have played things out a little bit more or he could have had a reset of scrums one or two, once or twice when Munster were in the, ascend in the ascendancy. Um, maybe but he made them play it. And now, maybe referees do want, you know, they, they, we don't want reset scrum after reset scrum. A but card earlier for the persistent penalties from... Yeah, you, you know, you, you could have obviously looked at that, but um, I think they, they were probably spread out enough to, you yeah. know, to, to, um, to allow them Clever. a little bit of lean, le leeway. Uh, Dunnick Ryan's pretty good, right? He <laughs> was so good again. He was excellent. I, I, his balance with um, Nakarawa, um, he does the grunt. He goes, does all the hard yards. Um, he brings the steel to them, and then Nakarawa is allowed you know, do all the, the, um, you know, the offloading and the ball carrying. And um, I just think it's a, it's a magnificent balance of the two. Yeah, a real pity that he's not part of the Ireland setup and like that strength and depth doesn't exist for us at the moment. Like, yeah, hey, listen, as Joe Schmidt says, you know, he, he's not gone, gone, but ultimately he will be. I think if he, if he went and picked Stunnick Orion um, now, it would send out a bad message. So I, I think uh, unless... It's just for the World Cup. Unless, unless Johnny Sexton. Um, well, you see, you have to remember, Ty Byrne's going to come into, yeah. into play now next year too. Yeah, so he was even in he the was, feet, he, he was, was very good. good. You know, the first that first play of the game, um, the mall that that he managed to hold up, um, he's a nuisance. Yeah, and he'll be a he'll be a brilliant addition for for Munster because I do think when it comes, they 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 were exposed in the tight five. 
um, last year against Arsenal, and I think again they're just lacking a little bit of punch in there. You look at the two, um, the two props, how good Gomez uh, and um, uh, Eddie Benaru as well were. Yeah. They were so good around the park. They were chop tackling. They were pilfering ball, um, and I just don't think we saw that from the Munster front row either. What What else do they need? Um, like how far away are they? I think they. I think they need. You look at you look at the the winners of the European Cup over the last ten odd years and who's been playing ten for them. So, you look back to um, Leinster with Johnny Sexton three times, Munst, or um, Toulon, uh, Toulon with Wilkinson, yeah. um, and Freddie Michelak in there, um, and then you've got Farrell yeah. a couple of times. Like Not they're bad. all world class players, and I think ultimately if you are going to go to a final and win it. You've got to have someone that's able to impose himself and run a game a little bit better than Ian Keatley has done over the course of, of the last few years. And um, they're just lacking in one or two, one or two positions. It, you know, it didn't help them that they've you know, lost two of their centres, um, you know, Taude and, and Farrell. I think Farrell would have been a great addition yesterday, just yeah. giving them a bit of, a bit of grunt. Um, and then, you know, it was a big call leaving Zeebo. I was about out. to ask, the last thing um, on this is like... Because Wooten, you know, was, got caught ball watching on that first uh, Teddy Tama try. I think, I've, I haven't seen Vakatawa passing the ball as much as he did in the game, but he, you know, I thought he had a very good game. Yeah. He mixed up really well, but he saw Wooten's shoulders turned in, threw it out to Teddy Tama on, a, on an outer, and he just absolutely burnt him. Yeah. Uh, so the Zebo decision was a bad decision. Well, in hindsight, of course, it's it, 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 it's retrospectively turned out to be a bad decision because he came on, played really well, and because Wooten was a little bit exposed, um, you know, maybe his inexperience at, at that level against that quality of an operator, um, he, you know, he, he didn't um, he didn't understand the role of of you know playing you know wing and 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 owning the outside. You know, as a winger, you can't get burnt on the outside. Yeah. You know, whatever by getting stepped. Back inside, someone has to, you know, and your hustle has to plug that and, and get a shot on them, but don't get smoked on the outside. Yeah, didn't help. Some quick fire questions. You wanted to talk about the um, player ratings. Yeah, I just found this interesting because if you if you have say um, you fifteen players and the subs on, I, Munster were expected probably to go very close yesterday. I would have presumed if not win the game. It's a three point game. Yeah, three point game, and then you have obviously Leinster would have been expected to win. But just the, the ratings in the independent today, right? So it's five or six for every Munster player apart from Keatley who got four. So it must be pretty tough. That's even less than five, obviously. <laughs> and then you have the Leinster guys. I've seen worse than fours in, over the course yeah. of, of, of my 15 years. <laughs> the zero from Prano. <laughs> now, I know player ratings are quite tough because sometimes you're double job and you might have to do a match report. I'm not really sure about this, but eight or nine for every Leinster player. I've never not seen a seven on a win. Yeah, yeah eight or nine for eight every nines, Leinster player. Yeah. Five or six were one four for Munster. So the notion that every single player for Munster underperformed and every single player for Leinster did at least an ace is like the collective is usurping the individual here or something. It just now I didn't watch the. I'm not a big rugby man, but for me it's just. I think it's a valid point. I think. Um, Did they all play that badly? Um, I don't think anyone. I think um, Connor Murray. Did Connor Murray get a six? Yeah. Um, you know, he he definitely in the second half in particular um, looked as though he was the best of them. Um, was every Leinster player an eight, eight or, or a nine? nine? Listen, you're, to, to your point, you're exactly right. They're double jobbing. They are. They're writing the article and then they're thinking f for a second. You know what? Well, I give this guy. Leinster were very good, and it was one of the most complete performances. So, you know, as much as Keatley was the one that got a four, who do you give the seven to in, in Leinster? That oh, he wasn't quite as yeah. good as anyone <laughs> else. It's, you know? it's kind of like it's kind of like you were talking about hindsight there, about Zee was like after the game. Um, we have this view, well, they lost, so therefore they kind of all were disappointing or they didn't perform, but surely one Munster player or one, one Leinster player didn't quite match, get an ace. And one, it's just like you're, you're carried through the emotion of Leinster were great, they all were eight or nines. Munster were crap, they you know all what were the five funny, or six. Do you know what the funny thing with Munster was? With, with 90 seconds, if they'd scored a minute earlier... There would have been something happening at that end. It would have been the yeah. kickoff. Yeah. So, mm. In all victories and all defeats, you know, you yes, they were they were outplayed, but they were only one score in the end. They they just ran out of time. How tough is that for Keatley now? We'll say if he if he were deemed to have kind of choked yesterday, if you want to use that, if and I didn't again, I didn't see the game, 
But if, and you're talking now about they need a new out half, and he sees, he just happens to see the papers, well, I got a four. That, professionally, that must be very, very tough to deal with. Yeah, uh, today is not a day for reading papers as a mm. professional. Don't, don't go opening an anything up. Player. You know, yeah, you don't. You have, to, you have to know when and when not to. And, but also, you know, he's an experienced player. He's 30 years of age now. He knows um, whether to, you know, who, who to be listening to, who not. You know, does he ever look at them? Don't look at them. If you're going to look at them in the bad, don't look at them in the good, too, because... Um, what because were you like in your day? Would you? I knew when not to read the papers. Mm. I knew what to. Of course, your ego wants a little bit of a tickle when you've gone well and you know, see what people are saying. But you get that on social media as well. You don't have to go to the paper anymore. So whether you stay off social media, because people, particularly on Twitter, people are pretty scathing. You know, I'd be just doing a day of Instagram because people are so much nicer on there. <laughs> Pinterest. Too quick. Uh, <laughs> so, some quick. Um, Twitter stock has fallen dramatically in the last minute. <laughs> Does Brian think Toulon are a better team than Racing, and as a result, would have been a tougher final for Leinster? Asks. Peter Horan? Well, uh, Racing, the way they played yesterday, um, there'll be a handful, but um, I think Toulon, I was really glad to see Toulon out of the out of the competition because I felt that they were the best French team. Yeah. Uh, and they they packed the, the most punch. So... Um, that opening 20 minutes would be, but like if Racing can do that over yeah, 60 but, minutes. Yeah, but, but you can't, I don't think Leinster will be nearly as passive as that. And also, you know, Racing have, have played their card with yeah. that's what they're capable of. So, you know, the Leicester be playing scared in the first 20 minutes of the prospect of conceding a couple of scores at a Munster and then chasing the game. So I don't think that will happen. What about Teddy Thomas showboating, asks Porrick Sweeney? That was absolutely nuts. I've never seen nuts. anything like it. I, I literally couldn't believe it. But by the way, he was on a hat-trick, a 20-minute hat-trick. Who gives that, who gives that up? Um, and then to your captain, it's like I know you're trying to get guys on side, but yeah. like, uh, what, what would, what if he, if he wasn't expecting, he went in for a hug? Uh, yeah, and, which he could have done, said, and dropped yeah, it. Could like, easily have done, and that would have been, that would have been amazing. Um, should one of Bernard Carby also consider Connacht? Surely being number one somewhere is better than getting splinters on the bench from a long-term well, international career perspective. They've just signed this guy from um, David. Um, his surname escapes me from the Brumbies. Um, who plays 10 and 12, David Horwitz. Horwitz. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, yeah, so he's uh, coming in. So, that, yeah, listen, let's not forget about Connacht as well. You know, they... That job um, appears to be gone. The, the, yeah, but, you know, it, they can play him at 12, but Bundy's at 12, so yeah. you're pushing him to 13 and all of that. So they've gone and, and stocked up there, and they you know, obviously paid big, big dough for an overseas player. So um, I think Connacht... Are, are also are another team in need, in need of a player just to build their team around at 10 yeah. and I hope they've signed them on a, at least three year. In hindsight, was the trip to South Africa a negative for Munster? Do you know what? You can look at it now and whatever it is, it's, um, is it is it 8,000 odd miles down there, so 16,000 mile round trip is um, is not ideal when, again, a, re a, a retrospective reflection. Yeah, um, first 20 minutes retros it Retrospectively, you... Jet lagged. Yeah, it was hot. It was interesting listening to Peter O'Mahony and John Van Graan talking about how hot it was going to be, how it's, you know, it's certainly not in their favour. Um, they, they had spoken of a, a, a being a great bonding exercise. Yeah, yeah, yeah and... So you're kind of like... So you, you, you've got to... You've, you've got to spin it the best possible way. There's no point in going down to South Africa and going, this isn't no ideal in advance <laughs> yeah. of you know, a semi-final. Yeah. We'll be exhausted. Yeah, with, yeah. So they did. And they Went down, they two good wins, yeah. um, morale boost, um, an opportunity to, to get away uh, for a couple of weeks together, which you, you rarely get to do um, as a provincial side. So, um, yeah, they, they, um, they looked like a team that was tired, though. Because I was speaking to some of the Leinster guys, and, and they said that that trip did really knock the stuffing out of them right. when, when they did it earlier in the year. So, you know, maybe, um, you know, looking back now, it, it had an impact on them. Um, but, um, yeah, it just shows you, you cannot give any team at that level, at semi final level, a, a, you know, a head start and expect to chase them. Last one for now is uh, we had a poll on Friday about Ireland's best rugby import over the last decade. Um, because it's Twitter, you can only have four options Brad Thorne, Dougie Hallett, Ruan Pinar, and Issa. Runaway winner. Rhetorical, isn't it? It is. 51% <laughs> yeah. of the vote was Issa. Um, 51. Yeah. And Pinar then. A uh, Pinar 26, no, yeah. Dougie 21. And, and who was the Fort Rocky? Brad Thorne. Oh, Brad Thorne. I would have put Rocky in personally, but I wasn't in the office when the uh, poll was made. Uh, but yeah. I mean, Issa's career is ridiculous. 
Yeah, he's he's the, two years he's the common Lewis. denominator on all success. Yeah, um, he's going to be playing in his fourth final, uh, Heineken Cup or Champions Cup final. He's lost at least two um, Pro 12 finals or Magnus finals, and won two, won a Challenge Cup. Um, yeah, he's um, he's been pretty good for Leinster. Should they keep him as a coach? Is there a possibility of adding him? I think to he's tickets? ready to go home. I, do you know what? It's funny, I haven't spoken to him for ages, but you get to a certain age, is he 35 or 36 now? And whatever about the body waning as well, I think sometimes, you know, you, you feel it, you, you get to a point where there's a disconnect from you and the 20, 21 year olds. Yeah. And it's, it's not as easy when you're the oldest guy and all, some of your pals are gone. Shane Jennings, a good friend of his, I know he's still pally with the likes of John Fogarty and that, but when guys on the pitch, you know, when you're looking down, you're going, I'm actually getting to the point where I could be your father or soon, <laughs> or soon to be. Um, I, I don't know, I think, I think I need to exit stage left. So. I'm not surprised that he's um, finishing up because he's still, he, do you know what, he's, he looks as though he's someone, I, and I get the sense that, similar to me in my final year, that you're treading water a little bit. Uh, you do feel a bit vulnerable, particularly out on the wing. I think he looks really good and secure in the centre, but that's because you know, there's, there's help all around him. Uh, whereas, because he's savvy, he won't get exposed badly on the wing, but it's, it's just it's just getting away from him a little bit. The, the gas, is, you know, that was once there, isn't really anymore. Yeah. So hopefully he can put a proper crown on it with uh, one last title. Yeah, and another a performance similar to the to the quarters or semis. I think they'll be a tough team to beat. Yeah.